Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be discussing the biomechanics of lateral flexion and rotation in the cervical spine. And if you want the more basic movements of flexion and extension, go back and watch the previous video. We'll start off by talking about lateral flexion, which is often called side bending. Now, of course, lateral flexion is named based on which side you're bending toward. So in this picture, we're looking at a posterior view of a person's neck, and this person is bending to the right. Again, they're putting their right ear in the direction of their right shoulder. So this would be right side bending or right lateral flexion. Now, when we start thinking about the biomechanics of this movement, it's really more helpful to think about the movements of the lower cervical spine. Hey, remember from a previous video that the upper cervical spine is really just defined as these upper two joints, the linoccipital joint, so between the occiput or C0 and the atlas, C1, and the linoaxial joint, which is between the atlas and the axis, or C2. Everything below that, so basically from the C2, C3 segment down to the C7, T1 segment, or some people will actually just say C6, C7 and not count this segment. But basically, when we start talking about lateral flexion and rotation, it's more helpful to think about the biomechanics first with the lower cervical spine, so between segments C2, C3, down through maybe C6, C7. Okay. Now, when we laterally flex to the right, notice what's happening here on either side, the left side and the right side of the cervical spine. Which side has more space or becomes longer? Well, the left side in this case becomes longer. If you actually look at this distance from here to here, it's longer. On the right side, so the side that you're bending toward, it becomes shorter. And you should be able to see that with the distance here. Okay? So the left side is getting longer and becoming more open, and the right side is becoming smaller and more closed. And so you can imagine what that's going to do uh, with the facet joints and with upsloping and downsloping. So let's first consider the ipsilateral side. Now in this example of laterally flexing to the right, that's our right side, but we're going to generalize it by saying the ipsilateral side. So if you think about what's happening with these facet joints, they're downsloping. Now in general, they're going more into their closed pack position because these facet joints are coming closer and closer together, right? So they're downsloping. And remember what downsloping means. It means that the vertebra above, so the superior vertebra, moves inferiorly and posteriorly relative to the vertebra below. So for example, if we consider the C3, C4 segment, on the right side where we have downsloping, C3 is actually gliding a little bit inferiorly and posteriorly relative to C4. And this throughout this entire segment leads to some effects. For example, on the right side, again, the facet joints are going more into a closed pack position, but also those intervertebral foramina or neural foramina as they're often called, get narrower. So there's less space for the spinal nerve roots to come out. And so if you have an individual potentially with a radiculopathy where the nerve roots compressed on the right side, they may not like to go into right lateral flexion because those intervertebral foramina are becoming more closed, leaving less space for the nerve root. Now on the contralateral side, so in this case the left, but generally contralateral, we're getting upsloping. There's more space here, so those facet joints are becoming farther apart. For upsloping, it's where the superior vertebra moves both superiorly and anteriorly relative to the vertebra below. So for example, the C3, C4 segment, we would say that for upsloping, C3 glides superiorly and anteriorly relative to C4. And again, with the combined upsloping on this side, we see a bunch of different effects. Those facet joints become more in their, in their open pack position, and the intervertebral foramina are going to gap they're going to become larger, more space for that nerve root. So for example, if an individual has a radiculopathy or where a nerve root's compressed on the left side, they may actually like right lateral flexion because it opens the left side. So we can basically say a general statement here uh, for this example. If we bend the head to the right, it causes right downsloping and left upsloping. 
or even more generally, when we go into lateral flexion or side bending, it causes ipsilateral downsloping and contralateral upsloping. Now, what's important to understand here about the lower cervical spine, C2, 3, and down, is that when we laterally flex to the right, we're also going to get a little bit of cervical rotation to the right. So lateral flexion and rotation, you really can't have one without the other. Okay? If I laterally flex to the right, as I'm doing here, I'm going to get a little bit of rotation to the right. Now the reason this occurs in the lower cervical spine, where we have right lateral flexion and a little bit of right rotation, is because in the lower C-spine we have what's called type 2 mechanics. In type 2 mechanics, lateral flexion and rotation occur in the same direction. Okay? That's what we see in the lower cervical spine. Here's a short explanation as to why, when we have lateral flexion, we can't help but have a little bit of rotation to the same side. And by that logic, we're talking about the lower cervical spine. And this explanation actually works for any region of the spine that follows type 2 mechanics. Doesn't work for type 1, works for type 2, but luckily that's most of the spine. So for this explanation, I've got these books right here. These each represent a vertebra. So this one right here in green, this biochemistry textbook, this one is the inferior vertebra. This one, P450, the black book, is the superior vertebra. Now obviously, I can flex, I can extend, I can do a lot of things here. Okay? This is the left side, this is the right side, and over here is anterior, which means closer to me is posterior. Now we're going to talk about lateral flexion first, and let's consider lateral flexion or side bending to the right side. Okay, so that would look something like this if we're looking at the osteokinematic movement. But here we're going to neglect the actual side bending and just talk about the upsloping and downsloping because that explains it. Okay, so if we side bend to the right, what did we say happens on the ipsilateral side, which in this case would be the right side? We have downsloping. Also on the contralateral side, so that would be the left side, we have upsloping. So upsloping on the left in this example, downsloping on the right in this example. So what is downsloping? Remember downsloping is inferior and posterior glide of the superior vertebra relative to the vertebra below. So if this gets a little bit of posterior inferior glide, really just consider that posterior part, this right side's gonna glide a little bit posteriorly. You may already be able to see where this is going. The left side has upsloping when I laterally flex to the right. Contralateral upsloping. So upsloping is anterior superior glide of the superior vertebra relative to the vertebra below. So if we have that anterior superior glide, focus on the anterior, this glides a little bit anterior. Well, look at that. The superior vertebra just rotated relative to the vertebra below. That's why when we laterally flex to one side, we can't help but have rotation that follows it to the same side, assuming we've got type two mechanics. And that has to do with those arthrokinematic movements, but really on an anatomical level, it has to do with the orientation of the facet joints. When we start talking about the upper cervical spine, that has type one mechanics. This is where lateral flexion and rotation occur in opposite directions. The way to remember type 1 versus type 2 mechanics is type 1, 1 is an odd number. So that means that lateral flexion and rotation are at odds with one another, so they're in opposite directions. Type 2 is even number. So again, same direction. So coming back here in the upper cervical spine, if I laterally flex to the right, there's actually going to be left rotation. And again, that's just in those upper two segments at the atlanto-occipital joint and atlanto-axial joint. Okay? So type 1 mechanics in the upper C-spine means that lateral flexion is associated with contralateral rotation. Now, before we go any further, let's look at the range of motion of lateral flexion. Up here I've had it's about 35 to 40 degrees. You can see that in the table down here, side bending 35 to 40 degrees. The vast majority of the contribution to lateral flexion range of motion is from the lower cervical spine. It contributes 30 to 35 degrees of that. Notice at the atlanoaxial joint, so C1, C2, there is no side bending that occurs. And then the atlanooccipital joint between the occiput and C1, that contributes 5 degrees 
of that lateral flexion, but none occurs at the alenoaxial joint. Now let's talk about rotation. So again, it's more helpful to think about the movements of the lower cervical spine. So let's take a look at this. This individual is rotating their neck to the right. Again, think about it, just which direction you're turning towards. So this is right rotation. The ipsilateral side is going to undergo downsloping and the contralateral side is going to undergo upsloping. What that means is, is if a person rotates their head to the right, so cervical rotation to the right, the right side downslopes and the left side upslopes. So let's consider the ipsilateral facet joints first. They're going to downslope. So that means on the, with this person rotating to the right, the right side downslopes. This is going to be superior vertebra moving inferiorly and posteriorly on the vertebra below. So in other words, if we consider that C3, C4 example, on the right side or ipsilateral side here, uh, that means C3 is going to glide both inferiorly and posteriorly relative to C4. Okay. Now, because there's downsloping on the ipsilateral side here in the lower C spine, that means that the facet joints are going to close or they're going to become more into their closed pack position, and also those intervertebral foramina are going to be uh, narrower. So if a person has a radiculopathy, a compressed nerve root on the right side, they're not going to want to rotate their neck to the right. Because, again, if we think about rotation to the right, that closes or narrows the intervertebral foramina here, so there'd be less space for the nerve root causing more irritation potentially. All right. Now, on the left side here, or generally contralateral side, the facet joints upslope in the lower cervical spine. So we have the superior vertebra moving superiorly and anteriorly. Again, if a person had a radiculopathy or compressed nerve root on the left side, they may actually like right rotation because on the left side during right rotation, these intervertebral foramina are going to open up. And that's because we have that upsloping. So maybe C3 would glide both superiorly and anteriorly relative to C4. And that creates more space there in the intervertebral foramina and more space for the nerve root. Okay, so think about those biomechanical factors. Now in this example, rotating the head to the right causes right downsloping and left upsloping. But again, we can make a blanket statement here that when you rotate your head, so cervical rotation, you get ipsilateral downsloping contralateral upsloping. And again, in the lower cervical spine, it follows type 2 mechanics. So lateral flexion and rotation are going to occur in the same direction. Okay? So with right rotation, we can't help but get a little bit of right lateral flexion. Okay? Just like back here, we couldn't have lateral flexion without a little rotation. Here, we can't have rotation without a little bit of lateral flexion. And in the lower C-spine, they occur in the same direction. So if this person rotated their head to the left, we'd get a little bit of left lateral flexion. Let's do another explanation here of why when we do rotation of the lower cervical spine, we also have lateral flexion to the same side. Again, as before, this is going to have to do with those arthrokinematic movements, the upsloping and downsloping. Okay. So again, this black book right here, I've got my superior vertebra, this green one down here is my inferior vertebra. Now just to orient you with what we're looking at, I want you to imagine that right here, this is the anterior surface of the vertebral body. So you're looking at an anterior surface. So we have to go according to the patient. So over here is left, over here is right. Okay, so this movement right here, just to orient you, this would be left lateral flexion because this is over at the left. This would be right lateral flexion because this is the right side. This would be left rotation, and this would be right rotation, okay? So let's imagine for a moment, let's imagine right rotation, okay? We're going to really neglect the rotational part and just talk about the upsloping and downsloping, but again, remember, we're doing rotation to the right. So based on what we just talked about, where would lateral flexion occur in the lower cervical spine? Well, if we have rotation to the right, we can't help but have a little bit of lateral flexion to the right. Okay, so if I rotate to the right over on this side, does this side upslope or downslope? Well, it's ipsilateral downsloping, right? This is downsloping. What is downsloping? It is where the superior vertebra 
translates posteriorly, and here's the key, inferiorly, okay? Over on the left side, what happens over here? On this side, we have, this is the contralateral side, because we're rotating to the right. So on the left side, we have upsloping, right? What is upsloping? It's where the superior vertebra translates or glides superiorly and anteriorly. The key I want you to remember is inferior glide on this side, superior glide on this side. What would that look like? It would look like this. Okay, because if I have inferior glide on the ipsilateral side, that's part of the downsloping. Superior glide on the contralateral, contralateral side, that's part of the upsloping. Look what just happened as I rotate to the right. I get a little bit of right lateral flexion. So hopefully that makes sense to you. And again, this has to do with those arthrokinematic movements and ultimately at an anatomical level, the orientation of those facet joints. But again, the upper C-spine follows type one mechanics where one is an odd number, so lateral flexion and rotation are at odds with each other. They're going in opposite directions. So in the upper C-spine, when it undergoes right rotation, there's actually a little bit of left lateral flexion. Okay? Or we can say that when we rotate the neck, there's contralateral lateral flexion or contralateral side bending. Now before we conclude the video, let's take a look again at the rotation range of motion. You can see that for rotation combined, it's about 65 to 75 degrees. Now notice here the lower cervical spine contributes almost half of that, 30 to 35 degrees, but the atlantoaxial joint, C1, C2, contributes 35 to 40 degrees of rotational range of motion. That's actually a little more than half of the contribution is just coming from the atlantoaxial joint. A little bit less than half is from the lower C-spine. Again, notice the atlanto-occipital joint, so between the occiput and the atlas, does not allow rotation. Just like the atlantoaxial doesn't allow side bending or lateral flexion, atlanto-occipital doesn't allow rotation. And a little bit more than half of that rotation is through the atlantoaxial joint. So hopefully this video made sense to you and gave you a good understanding of lateral flexion and rotation in the cervical spine. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.